Plateau State bleeds from the killing of more than 20 travelers over the weekend. Police arrest 20 suspects and deploy intervention teams to maintain peace. University of Joss uh, cancels examinations also. The capital of Afghanistan falls to Taliban fighters with President Ashraf Ghani fleeing country. This happening 20 years after the militants were chased out of the country. And a group of Nigerians insist that they will stage a million-man march at the United Nations headquarters to press for referendum for self-determination. We'll bring you these and more. And with that, we'll say good morning and welcome to The Breakfast on PLOS TV Africa. A uh, brand new week and, uh, of course, a Monday morning, just a uh, few more steps in the month of August. Good morning to you. Good morning to you. I am Annette Felix. Thanks for joining us on The Breakfast and good morning to you. And I am Osaogi <laughs> Ogmon. <laughs> All right. So um, our top trending stories today, one makes me really sad because of the reality that stares us up in the face and the fear you know, of what people have regarding what might happen in Nigeria. But before we go into that, let's, uh, let's begin on a lighter note. So it's a battle of the pastors, right? TB Joshua versus Chris Okoti versus Odumeji Indaboski. Oh, well, well, not TB Joshua, TB Joshua is late. Um, um, he is the center of exactly. the discussion. Exactly. So this whole started when, first of all, we know that about 20 years ago, um, Chris Okoti put out statements warning TB Joshua, the, the, you know, the uh, late TB Joshua, God rest his soul, um, warning him basically uh, about his ministry, you know, his style of, you know, prophecy, deliverance, and all of that, basically at antagonized all that. And um, we saw that eventually, the sad news that struck most of you know the religious bodies in Nigeria, the fact that TB Joshua passed on, that was on June, June 6th, the um, burial ceremony held, she was graced by some prominent people, tributes pouring in, his members, you know, feeling very sad. Remember, even you covered um, some of the events that, uh, you know, came on after that. But the bone of contention here is that the pastor, Chris Okoche, um, released a couple of statements. First of all, published on Facebook, and then in a lengthy over one hour video where he was talking about um, TB Joshua, calling him all sorts of names, saying that he was a wizard at Endor. Um, Chris Okoche went on to say that TB Joshua receives prophecies from familiar spirits that are not of God, and that even if the prophecies came to pass, it doesn't stop the fact that they are um, fake prophecies, according to Chris Okoche. Chris Okoche also said that TB Joshua has a fake and a counterfeit church. He added that his members are only looking for temporary solutions to the parliament and problems, and that, you know, they would never get the solution to their problems going to Synagogue Church of All Nations. Chris Ogochi also went on to give a warning to fake prophets and prophetess, people who misinterpret God's word according to him, saying that they are not called by God, they are Jezebels, and that those people's time were up, and that God will smite them into dust. Those were his words. Um, shortly after, Odumeje, who, who is very popular, for his, you know, style of preaching, his grammar, you know, and all the miracles and deliverances he conducts in his church, you know, showing power, showing force, physical force in church, how he, you know, comes on social media to just bear his mind about things. So he's got he's gotten very popular in Nigeria. So Odom J came on social media, um, actually on his church, now published on social media, to say that. Um, T.B. Joshua is a lion, T.B. Joshua is a, is a soldier, and that he would not stand and watch T.B. Joshua be insulted by Chris Okoti. He also said Chris Okoti was a stupid person. He went on to use other you know, words like that, said he had never seen him perform a miracle in his life, and that um, Chris Okoti can never be equaled to um, TB Joshua. But we'll have a video of that, you know, hearing Odumeje speak in his own words, you know, as he antagonizes um, Chris Okoche for calling out TB Joshua. Take a listen. My fellow prophet, Emmanuel TB Joshua, did his, chair, did his duty without a social man, but the lion become a social man, and you are still talking. He is not a social man, and you are still talking. 
I want to correct an person that I want to speak something. And there was a man that don't want the general to rest in peace and allow their family to mourn the general. And this man is Chris Okotie. Young man, we have respected you enough and I have never seen you done anything in this life. I have never seen you save any show. I have never seen you done one miracle that TV Joshua have ever done. But you come out and say that TV Joshua is a devil and you started to analyze the ways when i answer emmanuel that is means i am a devil to answer the name of my father when i name my church synagogue because you have right to name your son your name and there you have it Odumiji there defending tb joshua and lambasting chris okochi for calling him a wizard at endor saying his prophecies and miracles a fake you know of course followers of these different churches would always pitch in defend who they want to defend defend who their papa their daddy in the lord is and then um, there you have it oh uh, well yeah um a, a lot of times you know um i would always advise pretty much the same thing with you know huge political figures you know that stay stay out of their battles because you know they, they eventually um would find a way to settle themselves you know but you know I, i've never you know heard of uh, bishop td jakes attacking joel austin or some or something like that right you know, in a different different climb entirely um it's only in nigeria that you hear things like this um you know in the news or you get to see videos like this but regardless of whether you know these are pastors i still think it is very very beneath you know any person to speak ill of the dead you know, a person who's passed on, who's had, who has family and, you know, millions of people around the world mourning them. It's very, very, very low to speak ill of them, regardless of what you feel. Um, and, you know, it really just shows the character of uh, Chris Okotie, because you would never hear, and this is, well, not praising anybody, but you would never hear um, um, Pastor um, Oyedepo, you know, any of all, the, all those, you know, class of people saying these type of things about, you know, a person who's late, regardless of how... Uh, their relationship was, you know, while the person was alive. Um, it also, of course, is, you know, speaking a lot about what, you know, we call Christianity here in Nigeria, you know, and what is exactly is uh, Chris Okoche's brand of Christianity. Um, and so it's, it's not just um, Odumeje who spoke. I think Pastor Joshua Aguinla also spoke, you know, and uh, called out Chris Okoche for his statements. Um, but of course, you know, I would agree with them, you know, that it is a very, 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 you know, sad thing to, to see happening and um, very, very low, you know, for Pastor Chris Okoche to make those type of statements over someone who is late. You know, everybody has their own idea of what Christianity is. Everybody is, of course, you know, pushing their churches, you know, mm -hmm. as much as they can to gather more, you know, more congregation every day. T.B. Joshua did, you know, what he, he felt was his calling here on earth, you know, and there's mil too many people who celebrate him. Um, across, not just in Nigeria, across the continent and across the world. True. Um, Chris Okoche, if he's been honest with himself, you know, has not in any way been able to pull the effect that Chibi Joshua did pull. Um, that's if, you know, if that's what their churches are for. Mm -hmm. um, and so he really has no right, regardless of whether they're pastors or not, to make those type of statements. Um, and um, unfortunately, we don't get to see church members, you know, call out their pastors for, you know, when they do wrong. Because there's many, many times when church leaders in Nigeria have erred or have done very, very wrong, and the church is still full on Sunday. Uh, because, you know, Nigerians are the type to realize that, uh, I don't think this guy really, you know, is, is, mm -hmm. you know, is a man of God, or I don't think this, you know, he was directed by God with this thing that he did. And maybe I should backtrack a little bit from this church. But we don't get to see that church is still full on Monday because, well, maybe, they, you know, they're there for, you know, other reasons aside. That. So, well, I will just say, you know, I totally understand Odumeje uh, and uh, Joshua Aguinla's, um, you know, statements and their reaction to Pastor Chris Okotie because it's very, very disappointing for, for um, you know, a church leader, mm -hmm. you know, to make those type of statements. A person who is supposedly meant to, meant to be living, you know, in the way of Christ, you know, True, uh, expectedly preaching and preaching peace and well, anyway, all of that. Well, anyway, Odumeje on his part said he's not a man of love, he's a man of war, so he was ready to bring out the guns. Oh, well. So. Um, moving on now, um, what's happening in the world right now is very shocking. And I say in the world because this is something that affects every one of us, no matter how we see it. Because it, what's happening in Taliban, when other terrorist groups, you know, look at what the Taliban is doing, they get emboldened in some form. So this affects us one way or another. 
Now, they call themselves the Islamic Emirates in Afghanistan. It's the Taliban. It's a, a militant and terrorist organization that has been militant, an Islamic organization that has just been terrorizing, you know, the, the Middle East for quite a while now. And um, it, it was shocking to see what happened yesterday in that country. We obviously know about the instability regarding politics and security in that, in that region, especially in Afghanistan, with all the United States involvement in having their forces over to you know, put in some, some peace. But what happened yesterday, seeing the collapse of the government, the uh, presidents fleeing the country, the takeover by the Taliban of the country, people trying to leave in droves, dozens of pilots fleeing the country, to, to fleeing Afghanistan to neighboring countries, neighboring countries detaining those people, different countries recalling their, diplom you know, their, their diplomats back from Afghanistan. It's, it's just a shame what's happened. And when we see um, former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo's um, response to this in the US, um, basically blaming the Biden administration, saying, you know, it's the pullouts of this um, U.S. military forces that have been in Taliban or that have been in Afghanistan all those years. You know, people begin to pull out receipts from the past to say that this is a deal that you signed in 2018. It's something that the Trump administration has been pushing for to make sure that, you know, trying to make sure that there's a deal between um, the United States, Afghanistan, and the Taliban saying about 5,000 prisoners had to be released, including the supposed new president of, of, um, of, uh, of um, Afghanistan. His name is uh, Mola uh, Berada, you know, asking for his release, the release of 5,000 others and so many other concessions saying this is something that, you know, the Trump administration set the stage for, you know, still lots of discussions, you know, about this to, to really get a clear picture of where this is headed. But it's total chaos right now in the country. We saw videos of the airports. It is overrun. People are just getting there in droves, trying to find their way out. But, you know, pilots have left the country. So the question we really need to ask, like, what is the future of Afghanistan right now? What is the new government going to look like? How are world powers like Russia and the US going to wade in? How is this going to affect neighboring countries in Afghanistan? What's the fate of their people? And really lots of questions regarding these things that have happened in the past 24 hours in the country. Well, you know, I just have a couple of lessons, you know, that I think I should point out uh, from this. The um, pretty obvious one is when the United States steps into any country to say that they're going to rescue their people or they're going to save them from a dictator or whatever, a lot of times it always ends in disaster. Um, and, you know, we've seen over time, you know, from world politics and from other incidents from other countries that... Um, the United States never really goes in to save anybody. They go in for, which is expected interest. for their own personal interest, you know. So, and at the end, um, war is money. And that's one thing that people need to always remember, that war is money. It's the biggest war machine ever. Um, and when you, you know, get, start war, money, trillions of dollars is flowing left and right. And that's some of the reasons why some of these wars ar around the world may never end. Some of these groups, terrorist groups that you hear about, may never just disappear because there's people making billions and billions every day and every month from these groups. So um, once again, when the United States says, oh, this country is, this, is, you know, it needs help, needs rescue, they're not going there to save anybody. They're going there for their own personal interests. And when they eventually leave, you get to see these things break yes, down. Yes. So there is that. What is the United States going to say? they have gained from 20 years of being in Afghanistan. And if you remember also that when this you know, invasion of Afghanistan and Iraq started, there was many, many countries, groups, NGOs, whatever you call it, United Nations even, who told them to not bother. Don't go into those countries. It's none of your business. But of course, George Bush and Dick Cheney at that time felt like they needed to convince the world that um, you know, um, Al-Qaeda you know, and, and um, you know, um, Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction. The, the U.S. needed to get in there to, you know, rid them of those things. Eventually, it became worse. Eventually, we then saw the birth of uh, ISIS, uh, ISIL, um, and we've seen the Taliban grow from strength to strength. Who's funding the Taliban? They're not funding themselves solely. There's countries who are funding them. They are used by certain countries to destabilize, if, if that's, you know, what the, the, the goal is at any time. And so... Um, we are going to be playing the ostrich if we feel like the U.S. and you know the West doesn't have a hand in what's going on in Afghanistan today. That is very, very um, um, hard to believe. They definitely have a hand somehow, some way, and um, they, of course, should take the blame wholeheartedly for what's going on in Afghanistan today. How did Afghanistan security forces, police, army, just crumble in three weeks? 
after 20 years of the U.S. presence. And for those who are saying that, oh, this is because, uh, you know, the, the U.S. US is pulling out their trips, how much longer was the U.S. meant to stay to in stay. Afghanistan? Exactly. Were they going to stay there indefinitely? No. The other lesson I'm going to put, point out here is, at what point was Afghanistan itself, as a country, going to wake up and train its own forces and be able to fight the Taliban by itself? The Taliban, they are not aliens. They are inside Afghanistan there. So at what point was the Afgan Afghanistan as a nation going to be able to wake up and stop being a, you know, stop, you, you know, instead of actually fighting, they basically were running the country wild and, and enjoying all the spoils of war. And that's what they've done. Eventually, now the U.S. is pulling out. We see the effects of all of that. So the, the Afghanistan's government also has a lot of blame here um, with their failure to equip and train their own security forces enough in 20 years. We're not talking of in two weeks here. In 20 years, this is shameful. The third point that I'll point out here is when we are dashing um, uh, repentant Boko Haram, Indomi, and Kaftan, when we are taking pictures with them and making placards for them on cardboard sheets, these are some of the things that we should keep in mind. Exactly what I point, said. There's, you know, it, it, there's see. No, let me finish. There's no terrorist. There's no true terrorist that wakes up in the morning and says, I've repented. I no longer want to be a terrorist. It, this no is a deeply these, ideological no issue. So, these, exactly. I never, no longer have these beliefs. It doesn't happen that way. We saw on the news over the weekend, oh, 150 have, you know, have surrendered. They have yeah, repented. No, it, it does not happen that way because they do not simply change their beliefs in whatever it is that they have interpreted from the, from the Quran or whatever they feel like you know, the, the Prophet has told them to do. Those things don't disappear. So when we are making these mistakes, instead of putting a foot down and stamping out completely in every single way, not just with the military, but also with changing the ideologies, with education, with a better infrastructure in the north, when we are continuing to, you know, to uh, allow these things to not be the forefront of our fight against insurgency, we are feeding a dragon that will eventually, you know, burn all of us. So let's use Afghanistan and not just Nigeria, every other country. Use Afghanistan as a very, very good example of what you should not do. There's no other country in the world, in the whole of the West, that would allow the amount of um, uh, allow the freedom that the Taliban has had for the la last long while. China and Russia also have a part to play here because um, in the last uh, couple of weeks, China has had meetings with the Taliban. They've put out statements saying that their uh, diplomats and their, their people are not leaving Afghanistan because they have no threat or they are not under any threat. So it means that they also have their own personal interest to step into Afghanistan after all this mess um, that is happening. Um, but in China or in Russia, you would not hear of any terror groups. In Saudi Arabia, you wouldn't hear of any of all these things. They do not exist. They do not let them breathe for two hours. Um, let's learn our lessons. That's really where all this is going. Oh, so let's again, learn the lessons really, that we should learn. Really, that is it. You know, when I, when I first began speaking, I mentioned the impact this would have worldwide because all the terror groups are taking notes, right? You really, you really said it all regarding the lessons that the Nigerian military need to learn because I think it's really appalling to see that a Nigerian military that should, that actually is constituted to protect the territorial integrity of Nigeria, defend our sovereignty, would we basically tolerate these terrorists and go ahead and say that they have repented and give them, you know, items, give them food, food items, give them relief items, toiletries and things like that. When there are constituted processes that should be followed in giving justice, Right in dispensing justice, making sure that these people are prosecuted for their crimes. I mean, don't we have constitutional provisions that takes care of people who engage in terrorism? Does it include giving them gift items? I really don't understand because I really, really hope that the Nigerian military is learning from what's happening in Afghanistan right now to sit up and know exactly what to do when terrorists are apprehended. I don't think it's just the military. I think it's the government itself. The uh, government the itself. It's not by itself. You know, it's the Nigerian government. Um, but you know, whatever it is. Another thing that I will mention. We saw videos um, of people scrambling at the airport Airports. in Afghanistan, you know, because Kabul had been taken over. Um, I just want to quickly also point out that those people that you see in the airports, you know, doing all they possibly can to get on a flight out of there, there's hundreds, thousands of people at the airport. There's just barely amount, you know, you know, 10, 15 planes there. Um, those people... The pilots are, are the, even jet, jet no, I'm just saying those people are the rich. They're the upper class. <laughs> they are the upper class people that are scrambling now like ants to get out of Af Afghanistan. The poor, 
don't have those options. The poor are going to remain there and choose either death or subjugation. That's, that's their only option. And so whoever it is that is in Nigeria today that's, that is you know, feeling like they, you know, these uh, concerns on, on Boko Haram and ISOP and the rest don't concern them, it's not their business, God forbid, and I'll say that, that we ever get to that stage. It's not going to be um, Mama uh, Tayo in uh, Okokomaiko that will be scrambling at there, but she doesn't care. She's okay where she is in the village, making her papa and Nakamu uh, and Nakara. It is you, the rich, influential, so-called upper-class person that will be scrambling at the airport trying to get out. Once again, God forbid. That's it on Top Trending. Um, quite a sad, um, sad event there in um, Kabul, Afghanistan. Lots of countries are chipping in, asking for a peaceful transfer of power, peaceful transition. Um, but we yet to see how that would end. But we'll take a break here and return to analyze the papers on Off the Press.